invite us to open our Bibles to our continuing study in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, we're in the last verse of chapter 12, verse 31, and we'll look at the 13 verses in verse 13, chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, but we'll start with verse 31 in chapter 12 as we read the text in a moment. Let me remind us again, chapter 12, 13, and 14 is one unit of thought. Let me remind us again that the Apostle Paul was dealing with the church, the church at Corinth. There was a mixed up, messed up church, if I can use that term. They were divisive, they had discord, they had difficulties, dissension among believers in the church at Corinth. The Apostle Paul ultimately dealing with some of the confusion and the source of that confusion and problem, and that is in the realm of the gifts. There are nine gifts. Some are temporal and some are permanent. The Apostle Paul deals with them in chapter 12, 13, and 14, dealing with the grace gifts that's utilized in the church the first century and some of which are utilized in the 21st century church even today. But let me remind us, in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, outlines the gifts. Chapter 13, he gives the control of those gifts, and that's the reason of what we call the love chapter. It's not there just to teach us what is love, though it does. The love chapter, as we call it, chapter 13, is in the Scripture because the Apostle Paul is pointing out what they're not doing in the church at Corinth. What they're doing is not born out of love, but out of dissension and division and discord, etc., etc., as we shall see in this text that is before us today. May I remind us that in chapter 14, the Apostle Paul deals with their misuse of the gifts and how the gifts are being misused. It's causing great dissension and difficulty in the church because the pride in the heart of a few that wanted to seem superior to the others, saying, my gift's better than your gift. And uh, as a result of that, major division in the church at Corinth. So out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word, would you stand, please, as we stand together and as I read audibly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, through chapter 13, verse 13. As I read audibly, follow with me in your Bibles. Verse 31, by the way, is out of place in chapter 12, if you'd put it that way. <laughs> it is literally the beginning of the unit of thought in chapter 13. So let me get us to understand that. Paul says, but, it's a contrast, different direction, going in a different direction now. But, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. What we see in chapter 13 is the more excellent way that he is speaking to them about. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have get the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could mo remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity, and by the way, that's the word for love. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeth, uh, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all ch things. Charity never faileth. Notice now, the but, the contrast. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. By the way, that one little verse is the key that unlocks the door to what he's speaking of about maturity. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, 
Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, love. Thank you, and we may be seated. I believe that perhaps the desire to be loved is the greatest desire in the heart of a human being. I believe that love is the basis of humanity in the world today. Love affects how we feel, it uh, affects how we think, it affects how we relate to others about everything and anything that we do. In fact, love can be uh, bring feelings of great joy, love can bring feelings of great pain and hurt, and there are moments in time when I believe that we can feel overwhelmed by love and yet at times feel empty and lonely without it. There's a need in the heart and the life of every human being to be loved. Love can comfort when nothing else can. Love can uh, unravel at the very last moment and be deceptive and destructive in our lives. To some, love is just an emotion. To some, love is just a feeling. To some, love is just what you would call a thrill or a warmth or a charm. It encourages and it strengthens us. Some see love as only a physical attraction, a desire for physical intimacy or sexual expression. So what is love? What does the Bible say in relationship to love? The Apostle Paul deals with that in a wonderful, wonderful treatise to get to the point of pointing out to the Christians at Corinth that what they're doing is not born out of love. But I want us to understand there are four different words in the Greek text that deal with the subject of love, and then we'll talk about that one that is the agape love. First of all, there's the eros love. We get our word erotic, or erotica from that. It's talking about sexual love. Love is described in great detail, by the way, in the Song of Solomon. Then you have the storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, long E, pronounced storge. Family love. It is a sense of belonging, of being, of uh, togetherness. It involves protection and care and a sense of security and a bond. That's family love. That's what we think about as a family. Then there's the phileo. We get our word, uh, the friendship love, brotherly love, the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It gives a sense of value and of worth. And then in the scripture we find the agape love. That is spiritual love. That is deep, caring, concerned love for the well-being of others. It is a selfless love. It is the God kind of love. And that's the kind of love that the Apostle Paul is speaking of here. When you study 1 John, especially in chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, it points it out very, very clearly where it says, And this was manifest, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, the covering for our sins. That is the God kind of love. It's the kind of love that the Bible is speaking of in this text where Paul is dealing with the Corinthians because of the difficulties, the divisions, and the discord in the church. They were self-centered. They were conceited. They were prideful. And it was a matter of me, myself, and I. You ever seen that, folks like that? It's me, myself, and I. It's my way of the highway mentality. And that's what Paul is talking about here when he deals with this subject of love in 1 Corinthians 13 in particular. And Paul directs them to realize that the best gift, the highest gift it to be exercised and to be experienced is the gift of love, the God kind of love. So I want us to think for a moment on the subject of the supremacy of love. The supremacy of love, or as I preached this text before, the supremacy of love. I've talked about it in the realm of practical sanctification. I've called it love is supreme. But I want to think on the subject today of the supremacy of love. It is supreme, and Paul says that. It tops all of the other gifts. And so in seeing this, I want us to look at, first of all, the preeminence of love reminded in chapter 12, verse 31 through verse 3 in chapter 13. We want to see then the performance of love revealed in verses 4 through 7, and then the permanence of love recorded in verses 8 through 13. It's an interesting, challenging subject, but keep in mind, as we study and do the word study in this time together, we must keep in mind the reason for this challenge in this text is because of what was taking place at Corinth. 
They were not lovely. They were not acting like God's people. They were not acting in love one toward the other. So notice the preeminence of love reminded. And by way of a little brief introduction to this subsection that we're dealing with, let me simply say I don't believe there's been any other text in all the Bible that's more loved, more quoted, and yet so totally taken out of context as this love chapter. Hear me. We will snatch it right out of the context. So, well, God says love is this, this, and this, and he does. But what is the context and what is the rationale? What is the reason behind this text being given talking about love? First of all, notice the supreme task. In verse 31 of chapter 12, it sets the stage for the balance of chapter 13 and opens the door for chapter 14 as we'll study that in the future. Notice the apostle Paul says, but covet, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Notice that word covet means to have a strong affection for, a great desire for, earnestly, the best gifts. It may, best gift. He's talking about the superior gift, the gift that is greatest in rank. He's talking about the gifts by rank, and the greatest in rank is the love gift, the gift of love. Paul is saying that there is there are some of you that are practicing some gifts without love. He is saying there, there are some that these spiritual gifts were more valuable than others. They were looking at it, as I said earlier, my gift's better than your gift. I can leap one building in a single bound. Uh, I can leap pews in the church. I can fall on the four froth, froth at the mouth and speak in tongues, if you will. And that's what Paul is dealing with. Literally, I'm putting it in the young blood vernacular, but as you'll see in our continuing study, that's exactly what the apostle Paul is dealing with. In fact, in that culture and in that era, the Greeks placed a, a major price on man's intellect and on as a top priority. The Romans worshiped man's power, but the scripture stresses man's character. And that's what uh, God is dealing with through the writing of the Apostle Paul here. The very apex of spiritual development is the development of the gift of love. Paul is pointing out that when exercising spiritual gifts, love is utmost. It is the greatest importance in the list of gifts. Paul points out the importance of love in contrast to what the believers were doing at Corinth. And I remind you of that, and we'll be reminded of that throughout the study of the balance of these next two chapters, in particular about the gift of love and how it's to be operative. Not only the supreme task, but notice the spiritual talents in verse 1 and 2. I like the way the Apostle Paul speaks in irony as he talks about some of these things to set the stage. Notice what he says, though. He's saying literally, suppose. Just suppose that I could speak with tongues, dialectos, languages, and keep in mind when I use the term uh, tongues and say dialectos, we get our word dialect or language from that Greek word dialectos. There in chapter 14, he deals with the word dialectos, language, and also glossolalia, unintelligible, ecstatic utterances. So I want us to understand the difference as we walk through the text. He says, though I could speak with dialectos languages of men and languages dialectos of angels and have not charity, that is love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Paul says, what if I could do everything that is known in the language of man? What if I had a wealth of knowledge of all of the languages. And by the way, he spoke a variety of languages. And he's using this as a hypothetical symbol of what he's wanting to say. He said, let's just suppose that I could speak with the languages of the then known world. I had the knowledge of all of the languages, but I have not love for God. Then uh, I am nothing. I'm a big fat zero, uh, nothing, empty. Uh, literally, he's saying, what if I could just uh, uh, be in all tongues, all languages, to all people, and speak in all of the languages, but I have not love. He said, I'm just a chattering, sounding brass, and tinkling cymbal, a noisy gong, if you will, is what Paul was saying. Empty, nothing, not a... But notice two things there. He's talking about the spiritual, supernatural tongues and the special talents, and then he goes on to talk about those special talents of what could be done if he could do so. And keep in mind, some of these things Paul could do. 
but he's speaking of this in kind of a symbolic sense to let them understand how small they are, how minuscule is small they think, and what they're doing in relationship to that lack of love in the church. Notice in that first verse, Paul says, let's just suppose that I could speak in every dialect, every language. Let's just suppose that I could speak with angelic languages. By the way, there's not one thing in the Bible that talks about the angels having some special dialect or some special language. He's using this as a point of irony as he speaks to them in relationship to what they're doing. Paul is not saying that there's some kind of heavenly angelic language. There are a lot of folks today that they speak in the ecstatic utterances, well, that's my heavenly language. That's how I talk to God. Horse feathers. You don't find that any place in the Word of God as that being a language where only God can understand. As I've had uh, people to say that, I say, what is it? God can't understand English? He can't understand French or German? What is it? There's got to be some uh, glossolalia that somehow, some way, that's the only thing he can understand? That's not what the Bible says at all. And yet we have a lot of folks believing that and practicing that in ministry and in service today. There's no indication of that in the Bible. Yet there's some today that will claim they have that the tongues of angels, they have the, the heavenly tongues talking with God. That's simply untrue. He is saying there spiritual talents. What if I have the supernatural tongue? What if I have special talents? Verse two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have the faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am zap zero, nothing. Void, vacuous. Paul is saying, look at me, believers. Let me, you see, several times he said, mimic me, follow me as I follow Christ. He is saying, let me be your example as to what ought to be done. And let me tell you what if I could do all of these things. And he talks about that in the realm of prophecy and perception and power. Prophecy, perception, and power. Could speak forth unknown things from God is what he's talking about with prophecy. Our perception could understand all mysteries, that is, all knowledge, literally seeing all the unknown, the special revelation, the unseen things, special unseen spiritual things from God. And God had given him that gift. He was able to do so. But he's saying, what if I could do that along with all of these other things? What if I had the power? And though I could remove mountains, he didn't say could. He says, what if I could? He's using it as a hypothetical understanding so that the uh, church at Corinth would understand what he's saying in the uh, sense of what they're doing. Paul said, just suppose I really could do all of these things and do not have love. I'm a big, fat zero, not a nothing. Why does he say this? Why is the Apostle Paul going to this depth uh, to point out to them their error and what they're doing? Because the Corinthians uh, were operating in the flesh. They were operating as babes. You remember the early portion of chapter 1. He says, you're carnal, you're babes. You cannot uh, understand the meat of the word. You're still on the milk of the word. He is dealing with those that are infantile in their spirituality, if saved at all. I've said where he talks to them as the saints, the hagias, the believers at Corinth in the earlier portion of chapter 1. I've said many times, uh, many of them saints you ain't because of what you see they're doing in the entire study of 1 Corinthians. But he's pointing that out to them. He's pointing out to them that they're simply babes fighting uh, over those spiritual gifts, those gifts as though they had some control themselves with it. The gift of prophecy and wisdom and knowledge and faith without love reveal selfless, a person that is absolutely selfish in themselves, and they are uh, practicing that which is unholy before holy God. Someone said, and I quote, it's like having a head, a full head with an empty heart, end quote. It's worth nothing, has no value. The supreme task and the spiritual talents, but I want you to notice the sacrificial trait in the third verse. Paul says literally, how much can one give to show his love? Paul said you can give all the treasures in all the world and you can be involved in every social program in all the world. You can build all the buildings and build all the ministries, but with, with the wrong motive, the wrong attitude, without love, it's nothing, zero. And though, listen, if I could give my body to be burned, sacrificed, and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Paul suggests that we could give the ultimate sacrifice a martyrdom, and if it's done without love, it has no value at all, none whatsoever. Paul says it's the wrong motive. 
He's pointing out that that's what the believers at Corinth are doing. They're operating in the flesh. They're operating with the wrong motive. And may I simply do a little footnote to that? I believe in society today, multitudes of Christians are operating with the wrong motive. It's the motive of, if I don't go, the preacher's going to call. If I don't go, if I'm not in church and somehow, some way, someone's going to say, where have you been? What are you doing? It's the wrong motive. The motive ought to be, I love the Lord Jesus Christ enough. I love him enough that I'm going to sacrifice my life and surrender my all unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ in all that I do. Paul is simply saying they're living at Corinth with the motive of pride. It was worthless, useless, without agape, God's love. It had no value. And I just made a little margin note how sad uh, much of this takes place in our churches today under the banner of spirituality. Those at Corinth were religious. They were involved in church, but without love for God as their motive, they simply were going through the act of religiosity without a relationship to Jesus Christ. The question is, where do we stand today? Where do you stand individually? Where do we stand collectively as a church? Where do we stand in America as the body of Christ? Paul says love is supreme, it's preeminent. Notice not only the preeminence of love reminded, but the major bulk of the center of the text in this chapter, verses 4 through 7, the performance of love revealed. In contrast to what the Corinthians were doing, Paul identifies nine or ten characteristics of love. It's nine, but you can break up the ninth one into about two or three parts. It is at least nine characteristics of love that's found here. They were jealous and they were envious. They were divided. They were having discord and difficulties. And Paul says, let me show you what love really is. And then we find the great treatise on what we call the love chapter. The great uh, 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 description, if you will, of what real agape, godly love is and how it ought to be applied. Notice, first of all, in verse 4, love is sacrificial. Love is sacrificial. The scripture says, love suffereth long. It is the word Marcos Thumos, if you will. And it means long to anger. Suffereth long. Literally, it means it's long-suffering. Uh, this is part of the fruit of the Spirit as found in Galatians 5.22. Literally, it means to have patience. You don't fly off the handle at the least little thing. There are a lot of folks today that you say about two words wrong, and they'll fly off the handle. Uh, the capacity here to be wronged and not to uh, retaliate. It's the willingness to sacrifice for someone else or for something else. This is what Jesus has done for the church in Ephesians chapter 5 where it talks about husbands loving the wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That is long-suffering. That is sacrificial love. And that's the kind of love that God calls on you to have and for me to have is that sacrificial love that will go the second mile, the third mile, the tenth mile in order to carry out what God would have us to do in service and surrender and sacrifice for his lordship in our lives. Love is not only sacrificial, love is sympathetic. In verse 4 it says, love is kind. It's understood love is. Where it says and is, it's talking about love. Love is kind. Literally not harsh, not rude, not brazen, but it's sympathetic. Kindness is the opposite of harshness and insensitivity. And they were having major problems with harshness and insensitivity in the church at Corinth. Love says, I feel for you. I understand you. I want to lock arms with you and walk down the difficult road with you. I want to be engaged with you and help you and not try to hurt you. And that was the opposite of what was happening in the church at Corinth. Love is sacrificial. Love is sympathetic. Love is secure. Verse 4, the latter portion. Love envieth not. It is the same word that's used for in chapter 12, verse 31, about the word covet. Love envieth not. Love is not jealous. Love is not covetous. Love is not envious with what others have and what others are doing. May I remind us, love is not any of those things. And it uh, talks about literally being able to boil or to seethe, uh, which leads to hate and as a result of that, murder. In fact, it was in Genesis 37, verse 3 through 11, Joseph's brothers were envious of him. And as a result of their envy, it led to hate. And as a result of hate, it led to murder and to carrying out of that evil deed in Joseph's life that they thought he was dead. May I remind us, Keep in mind, Paul's discussion of the greatest gift, and that greatest gift is love, relates to the problem related to spiritual gifts at Corinth. Notice not only we find love is sacrificial and love is sympathetic and love is secure, but number four, love is submissive. Love is submissive. It says, vaunteth not itself. 
Vaunteth not itself. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not puffed up, not arrogancy, not prideful. It is submissive, willing to give in. Love doesn't say, let me use my gift. My gift's better than your gift. I want you to see how great I am. That's the mindset they had at Corinth. And Paul is dealing with that. Love is submissive, vaunteth not itself. Love is sincere, in verse 4. Is not puffed up. That literally comes from the basic Greek word meaning to be a braggart. Always saying, look at me. Always talking about me. It refers to the inflation of one's ego. It refers to the one's uh, ego being inflated to the point of he feels self-important or his abilities or achievements are above anybody else's and he wants to brag about it, does not brag. You remember in uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 10 and following, the two men went up to the temple and one basically said, the Pharisee said, Lord, I'm so thankful that I'm not like other men are. I do this, this, and this. And the other man then smote upon his breast and said, Lord, forgive me, look at me. I'm a sinner. It was his attitude before God. And that's the attitude that Paul is talking about here. Love is not puffed up. It is sincere. A love that is sincere. It means uh, literally here to manifest a superior attitude towards someone else. An inflated opinion of self. It's when a person thinks that he has gifts and talents and abilities and self-produced rather than recognizing it is a grace gift from God. Love is sincere, the scripture is saying. Not puffed up, not prideful, not arrogant, not a phony. Doesn't go around bragging about his gifts or boasting about what he's done. There's some folks that I've said for many, many years, I'd like to buy them at what they're worth and sell them for what they think they're worth. I'd make a million dollars. <laughs> we see too many braggarts today. Love is sincere, real, no show, no shine, just who... They are in reality. Love is sacrificial, sympathetic, sincere, secure, submissive. But love is also sensitive, verse 5 says. Does not behave itself unseemingly. Literally means, means to be uh, having rudeness. The word here refers to the outward appearance. It refers to how someone, something is said or done rather than what is said. Love is sensitive, not blunt, not rude, not brazen. Love responds with a tactful, sensitive uh, response to the question or the confrontation. Now, may I tell you, that's a difficult one to handle. <laughs> you ever been faced with somebody? You know, they say that... Um, Dumb is fixable, but stupid is not. <laughs> there are a lot of folks that you come in contact with that you have dialogue and discussion with, and you have to make a quick decision. Is that dumbness or stupidity? If it's stupidity, you're wasting your time trying to deal with them to make a correction. If it's dumbness, there is a possibility to change it somehow, some way. But that well, love is sensitive and ought to be sensitive, as I've said many years, ought to be sensitive to the discernment of what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with and making that judgment call to respond to them. I believe we could use more love in our response among believers in particular today. Rudeness and bluntness are not a way to reveal God's love. Love says the proper things at the proper time in the proper manner in a loving way. That's a tall order for any Christian. I don't know if you've ever failed at that. I have. <laughs> love is selfless, we find in the fifth verse. Seeketh not her own. A major problem today is me, myself, and I. Sinfulness and selfishness. And you find that in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 17 and 18, and we've talked about that, where they had the mindset and the attitude, and the Apostle Paul says, I've heard that there's some dissension among you, and I believe it because of what they were doing in the church. In fact, if you don't believe that love is uh, selfless, seeking not her own, ask my bride. I'll pause for a moment to see. I'll tell you what, and I, I can brag on her because she... She's put up with me for less than 100 years. But, <laughs> but she'll go in Steinmart and she'll say, let's go to Steinmart. I've got some things I need to find. And she'll pick that out and she said, I bet Debbie would love that. It's just her size too. You want to let's get that for Debbie. She'll look over here and there's something. Well, I think that, and she'll talk about one of the grandkids. I think that'll fit them. Uh, should we get that? We walk out of the store with a half a dozen things and she's bought nothing for herself. But it's always thinking about someone else. It is a selflessness of wanting to help someone else, to benefit and to bless someone else. And may I say, that is needed in life and in living and in our churches today and among Christians than anything else I could think of is a selflessness. The Apostle Paul says, love seeketh not her own. 
And love is not only selfless and submissive and sincere and sacrificial and sympathetic and sensitive and secure, but it's also stable in verse 5. Is not easily provoked. Is not easily provoked. <clears throat> now, I won't, don't dig too deep and cause any consternation or concern, but the word easily is not in the Greek text. It's in our English Bible. It's an added word. I'm not trying to muddle the Scripture, or detract from the Scripture and the power of it. So let's just look at it. Love is stable. Is not provoked. Literally not quick-tempered. Doesn't fly off the handle easily. Understands and handles problems and not in a hostile manner. Not to goad it into action because of some circumstances. It's easy to blame others that provoke us and say, well, the, he made me do it. You know, Flip Wilson said, the devil made me do it. There are a lot of folks that will have that philosophy and the feeling today that someone else made me do something. But love is absolutely stable, is not provoked, uh, and you would put it on the basis not quick-tempered, not hot-headed, not flying off the handle. It has the idea of stability that will analyze a situation first and not be provoked into a premature action or decision. Love is sacrificial, sympathetic, secure, submissive, sincere, sensitive, selfless, stable. But also in verse 5, love is spiritual. Love is spiritual. Thinketh no evil. That word thinketh means to ponder. It means we're not pondering, literally not suspicious. We do not hold uh, in our memory an evil deed that's done to us. Someone says, well, I'll forgive him, but I'll never forget it. <laughs> you ever heard somebody say that? That is pondering on evil. That the word evil is the word poneros. It means bad. Something that's bad has happened. Something that's difficult. And somehow, some way, we do not want to turn it loose. Love does not ponder. Love does not harbor. Love does not consider on a long-term basis that which is evil, that which has been done that's wrong, but is spiritual and will forgive others. We must love as God loves. God's love does not ponder and calculate revenge. But verse 6 and 7, love is supportive. Love is supportive. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity. Iniquity is the word for twisted, perverted sin. Love rejoiceth not in twisted, perverted sin, but rejoiceth in truth. And by the way, truth is a forgotten word in the vocabulary of the Americans, I believe, and around the globe today. Most folks do not know what truth means. Most do not know how to find truth or what to do if truth slapped them in the face, I've said so many times. Love does not rejoice in the sins and the misfortunes of others. Goody, 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 I'm glad you fell. I'm delighted to see that this has happened to you. And it's so easy to fall into that category if you're not careful. Love recognizes that spiritual gifts do not produce spirituality. The Corinthians were rejoicing in their sins. They were rejoicing in, their plight, in the plights of others. They were rejoicing in the hurts of others rather than rejoicing in the truth of the Word of God. And conversely, love, God's kind of love, does two things. Beareth all things, that is to uphold, as a tent up, is upheld by the poles. It means to cover, to protect, to support in all things. Beareth all things, believeth all things. That literally means not suspicious, uh, does not question the motives of others when they do something for the Lord. This is not to suggest that somehow, some way, a Christian is to be gullible and simply believe everything. We can analyze it, look at it, scrutinize it, and make a judgment call, but it does not mean that in any way we're going to be gullible in what others say or do. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. We're to be fruit inspectors. Notice what love does also in that verse. Love hopeth all things and endureth all things. Literally, love hopeth, that has the understanding of faith. It believes the best. It anticipates the best. It anticipates the good that will result from anything and everyone in every case until shown otherwise in our lives. You don't just simply believe that somehow, somewhere, in fact, one of the greatest dangers we have is the rumor, the hearsay, and the tear down by words and destroy an individual, assassinate a person by the words that is used in society today. You find that in a political circle more than any place else. You find that oftentimes in Christian circles where it's the tongue assassination. I've said before I'd rather have a person pull a 30 out, 38 pistol out, and I can see the uh, six cartridges in the chamber. I'd rather see that and know that they're against me than have someone talking about me behind my back, assassinating my character that I cannot do anything about because do not know who, what, when, and where. 
And that's what the Scripture's thing, talking about here. Hope is all things. It's believing the best, anticipating good, rather than anticipating that which is evil and bad. It refuses to accept defeat also. Not pessimistic. Not doubting. Where love is present. There's a vision that grows, and it's God's kind of love that produces optimism and hope in the heart of the child of God. And love endureth all things. That means to persevere. It means to bear up under the load. It means to be willing to keep on keeping on regardless of the conditions and the circumstances. It means to be patient in the endurance and perseverance. All of, the, all of this results from love, the God kind of love. This checklist of love, by the way, ought to be manifest in the lives and the hearts of believers even today, even though it was first given to the church at Corinth by the Apostle Paul. How do we measure up? When we look at the preeminence of love reminded, the performance of love revealed, and keep in mind all of those positives of love was what Paul was using to show them what they were not doing in the church. It was a manifesto, if you will, written from the pens of the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God to set forth correctiveness and correction in his castigation of the church at Corinth for what they were doing. There was an error because it was not done out of a heart of love. But I want us to understand now, love is the key that we've just looked at. But what is the results and what is the remedy and what are the factors that Paul is dealing with that is shown in verses 8 through 13 that must be understood, must have an absolute link to what has just been said in the first few verses about what love is and what love is not. He is the reverse, uh, reverse positive, if you will, pointing out what love is not to show what love is in relationship to what they're doing. Notice in verses 8 to 13, the performance or the permanence of love recorded. The permanence of love recorded. Notice the last six verses of this chapter are beautiful, majestic descriptions of the greatness and the power of God's love. It is the more excellent way that he spoke of in chapter 12, verse 31. Let me show you a more excellent way. Inserted in that more excellent way is what love is and what love is not. And then he gets back to the point of what he's just stated in chapter 12, verse 31. Let me show you a more excellent way. And what you're seeing now is the track that he's running on is the track of God's kind of love, the agape love. And then notice what he says, the steadfastness of the gifts. He's talking about the gifts. Keep in mind, one seamless thought, chapter 12, 13, and 14. It's the gifts of the Spirit. It's the control of the gifts found in verse chapter 13, which is love, and the misuse of the gifts found in chapter 14. So notice what he said here in verse 8, the steadfastness of the gifts. First of all, notice the timeless gift. He says, love never faileth. Love never faileth. Literally, love at any point, never at any point, never at any time, past, present, or future, do you find love failing. It's never without force. It's never without power. Love always works. It's timeless. It's lasting. It's eternal because it's God's love. And here Paul is comparing and contrasting the gifts of chapter 12 with the gift of love, agape love. May I remind us, the temporal gifts, but love is timeless. We need God's kind of love more than any other gift in our lives today. It illustrates the unfailing nature of love and its timeless importance in our lives. Notice not only we see the temporary gifts and the time, timeless gifts, but notice the temporary gifts here in verse 8. First of all, notice the scripture says, But whether there be prophecies, they shall, didn't say maybe, perhaps one day, notice the positive, they shall, that's positive, fail. That word for positive fail means to render useless, to make inoperative, to no longer be necessary, to no more foretelling of the word of God. We have the, his revealed word which is called the Bible. Prophecies shall fail. Propheteos means to tell forth sharing, preaching, teaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is forth telling the word of God or telling forth the word of God. And after the Bible, after that, the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God, there are no more prophecies today. Yet you have those that are the prophets. They're going to give some ecstatic utterance and someone else will stand up and say, this is what it means and translate it supposedly because they're trying to follow what's said in chapter 14, 1 Corinthians, the latter portion, but they're doing it incorrectly because prophecies shall fail. Listen, 
And he says, tongues shall cease. The word cease is the Greek word poeo, means in and of themselves, stop. Paul says prophecies would fail, but tongues shall cease, literally come to an abrupt halt, an abrupt stoppage. Tongues shall be no more. Tongues were needed as long as prophecies and knowledge were being communicated, but prophecies and knowledges both refer to the revelation from the word of God. Remember, the signs, miracles, and wonders were to authenticate the message and the messenger. We have the word of God today that if a person stands and preaches or says, thus saith the word of God, I want him to show me where is it found in the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. If it's not there, God didn't say it. You can go to the 23rd chapter of uh, Jeremiah, and uh, God is dealing with the false prophets. And if you listen to the young bud vernacular, they were saying this, this, and this to the king. And God says, guys, what are you talking about? You ain't even talked to me. I've not told you anything. And yet you're telling the king to, uh, that this is what God said? And we have that taking place on a prolific basis today in America and around the world where there are those that are claiming to have the gift of prophecy, and the Scripture says, prophecy shall fail and tongue shall cease. A lot of folks need to know that and learn that lesson of what the Scripture says. Knowledge shall vanish. That means to fail, to vanish away, to render useless, to be inoperative. The word for prophecies and knowledge are all the same and indicate their purpose will be rendered useless by the influence of something outside themselves. We have the Bible, the full revelation of God. No more need for prophecies and prophets or revelation or knowledge as it's called. God's given me a gift of knowledge. Somebody out there's got a back pain. Well, about 90% of the public has a back pain. So he's just spoken to everybody out there. So send me your $100 because I've just prayed for you. That's a hoax, and we have the hoaxers that are carrying that out today. It is the false prophets that are just simply, uh, as Second Peter chapter 2 says, they're doing that to make merchandise out of you. That means they're doing that for your M-O-N-E-Y, if you don't understand what I'm saying. Not only we see the steadfastness of the gifts, but I want you to verse, notice in verse 9 and 10, the scope of the gifts. The scope of the gifts. Notice, gifts are incomplete, verse 9, for, it's the little Greek word gar, because, why is he saying that prophecies shall fail and tongues shall cease? Listen to the cause. It's because, if you're from the south, it's cause. Paul says in verse 9, cause we know in part and we prophesy in part. You see, even the gifts that are today, even the gifts that are given are partial in revelation. It's not total. Gifts are inoperative in verse 10, but when, and this is the key to this entire portion of this unit of thought. Listen to what the scripture says. But when that which is perfect is come, that word teleos, means mature. It means complete. When that which is mature, when that which is complete is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Perfect, mature, complete. What is the completeness? What is the maturity that Paul is talking about? I've heard a lot of people and a lot of diatribe being picked up. Most of the commentaries and books on the subject and the well-known theologians and academic minds of the Bible will say, well, that's talking about where, uh, when uh, Jesus comes. He's complete. He's the one that's perfect. He's the only one that's perfect. So tongues are operative until Jesus comes. There's a Greek word for that, horse feathers. That's not what he's saying. The Word of God is the best interpreter of the Word of God. In fact, in most cases, you don't need to take a commentary to say, wonder what God is saying. Let's see what Dr. Divine says or Dr. Johnny Come Lately says. Let's see. You can study the Word of God in context, and generally speaking, in that unit of thought, in that chapter, it will explain what God is saying. And here, the Scripture but when that which is perfect, mature, complete is come, then that which is past shall be done away with that which is in part, mature, complete. It's the spiritual maturity, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2, you're babes, you're carnal. They were divided, they were uh, fighting, they were immature, they were babes spiritually, and each one trying to show off his own spiritual gifts. Some say this refers to the coming of Jesus. It says that it's going to be complete. But I want us to understand, and some even says that no, it's when the uh, word of God, the canon of Scripture is complete. So there are three different uh, theological dogmas that stress when that which is complete has come. Some say it's when Christ comes. Some say, no, they didn't have the completed canon of the New Testament then, so when the New Testament is completed, that which is mature and complete has come. That's not what the Scripture is saying. How do we know that? Scripture in context explains that. May I remind us 
the Apostle Paul deals with it very, very clearly. Notice in verse 11, he says, gifts are immature. Gifts are immature. Paul takes a spiritual, talks of spiritual immaturity by contrasting it with the physical maturity and immaturity. He says there in verse 11, it's very, very needful. When I was a child, now why did he all of a sudden, if he's talking about when Christ comes, or if he's talking about when the Bible is completed, why did he insert in verse 11 a physical element of spiritual or physical maturity and immaturity? He is giving the rationale, the reason that he's talking about when that which is perfect has come. He says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, mature, I put away childish things. Listen to what Paul is saying. It unfurls, it opens, it's the key that opens the door on the understanding of prophecies failing and tongues ceasing and when it shall be done. Notice the apostle Paul says, he said, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, I was partial, I was immature, I thought as a child, I was selfish, it was my way or no way. But when I became a man, an adult, mature, when I grew up, when I became mature, I put away childish things. He is saying, church at Corinth, listen carefully, what you're doing is childish, what you're doing is immature, what you're doing is not born out of godly love, what you're doing is not born out of agape love, the love that God has for us. It's immature. You ever seen two children in a nursery at home or at church and a child walks over and picks up a toy? This one over here already playing, he's satisfied. By the time he sees that one pick that one up, he rushes over and snatches it from him. <laughs> then you have a little brawl and a ball that takes place as a result of it. That's immaturity. Paul says, when I was a child, I acted that way. When I was a child, I thought that way. When I was a child, it was me, myself, and I. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. He says, dear Christians at Corinth, you're acting childish. You need to grow up. You need to be mature. And it goes back to chapter 1, and the early portion of that chapter says, you're childish, you're immature, you're absolutely carnal. You cannot uh, understand or live off the meat of the word. You're still on the milk of the word because you're immature, you're childish. Everyone, every place today, in every church, in whatever denomination, when they're using these ecstatic utterances, they are childish, childish, childish. They're not mature in the scripture, and I can say that with absolute authority because I've dealt with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, and one on one occasion said, I don't care what the Word of God says. I know what I've experienced. You can have demonic experiences until Jesus comes. It doesn't change the Word of God and the reality of what God's Word is authentically saying to us. It's clear that Paul is saying, you're immature, you're childish as Christians. You need to grow up spiritually, you need to mature, you need to put away childish things. You need to become a mature adult in spiritual thinking. And there's a great need in our churches today for Christians to grow up, to be mature in the Word of God, in what God's Word says. And the only way that's possible is to be, first of all, saved, saved, saved. And if you're saved, there's a hunger for the Word. There's a desire for the Word. There's a desire to be nourished by the Word of God. You show me a person that never reads the Bible. You show me a person that never prays. You show me a person that never ties. I'll show you a person that 99 chances out of 100. He's lost and without Christ as Savior and as Lord. When a baby is birthed physically, he's hungry, he wants the milk, he wants to be fed, he wants to be nourished. When we're birthed in the family of God, we want to be nourished on the word of God, the meat of the word of God. The steadfastness of the gifts, the scope of the gifts. But I want you to notice in verse 12, the spiritual growth, twofold. First of all, the present is incomplete and the potential is incomprehensive. Notice, for now, the present tense, for now, we see through a glass darkly that's obscured, enigma, incomplete, as to all God has for us. We can't see all that God has for us now. We're a whole lot further down the road than Paul was. We're seeing through a glass darkly. I've used the term before, it's like a curtain is drawn. The shears are still there. We can see the stage being set. We can see the players in place, ready for the curtain to draw open and for God to usher in eternity that is before us. Spiritual growth, the present is incomplete. The potential is incomprehensive. But then, then when? 
Then, when we stand before Jesus, then shall I know, even as also I am known. With Scripture, with the Word of God, with the gifts given, we only see partially, obscurely, but there is a day coming when we'll see Jesus Christ face to face and be able to sing around that throne, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world for your sins and for mine. But notice the culmination of this unit of thought, the supreme gift. Verse 13, and now abideth, that's minnow, to stay, to dwell, to abide. Now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest, the best, the one that is best that he's spoken of in chapter 12, verse 31, that he says to covet is supreme, is superior, and that is love. Love is timeless. The gifts are temporal. Love is never rendered ineffective. Love is to never be rendered inoperative. Love is to never be viewed as powerless, but always superior. Today we have faith, hope, and love. The Bible says love is supreme. And may I remind us one day faith will become sight, and hope will become reality, and love is eternal. I pray that you are keeping track with where we're going and what's being said. It's not just out of words. It's biblical teaching at the very fundamental foundation of all that God would have us to know. As we see the false theology that's being proclaimed today, as we see the error in multiple denominations today and lives, they need to understand what the Word of God says. You can't just pick and choose a verse or a thought or a saying. You've got to look at it as a unit of thought in context to see what God is saying to us. I pray that this would have challenged you to a deeper study of the Word of God, that we will study the Word, meditate on the Word, know the Word, apply the Word in our lives, impacting the Word in the lives of others.